Amen? Amen. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your people that are here. Lord, I thank you uh, for what you're doing in and through our lives. I humble myself before you. Lord, I ask that you speak through me. Give to your people what they need here today. I thank you that you're so awesome and God enough that you know exactly what needs to be spoken. Lord, let me speak your words to encourage and challenge us all in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen, amen. amen. We'll just continue in this week and uh, Lord willing, next week in this series. And I am uh, blessed is the word of how many people have come up and actually said, Pastor Mike, I've never, ever heard this type of a message between soul and spirit. I've never heard a teaching on that. And it has so helped me in my, in my walk with the Lord uh, in understanding uh, myself and some of the struggles that I go through and understanding what my role is in, in following the Holy Spirit and reckoning our soul dead. And so with that, I say thank you, but praise the Lord. That's exciting. Amen, church? And so uh, we're just going to continue here on week 13 uh, on the spirit and soul. In our text uh, is uh, Mark chapter 4, uh, Mark chapter 4. And uh, I'm going to just read just to bring us up to speed because I haven't read it in the last few weeks. Uh, Jesus, when we, we jump down to verse 13, uh, if you want to pull that up, it says, the parable of the sower explained, and he said unto them, <clears throat> do you not understand this parable? So Jesus is explaining it. He says, how then will you understand all parables? So there's something important about this parable that explains all parables. He says in verse 14, the sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside, where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Verse 18, now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Verse 20, but these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. Somebody say amen. A text I just want to touch on here today is in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It's very interesting about when we hear the word, there is a function and a role that we are to engage in. It says, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Say, did not profit. You can hear the word of God and it do nothing for you. Well, I thought I was in church. I heard the word. And why didn't it feel like? And that's the whole premise of this series. Why does it seem like the word is not working in our life? It said it did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith. Interesting. In them that heard it. In them that heard it. So we'll delve in that into a little bit. We have our basic illustration here we've been using each week uh, about the, uh, has God has, how the Lord has created us as spirit beings, having a soul a mind, will, and emotion, and we operate in a body. We operate in a body. And I said this, that the reason possibly the Word of God is not working in our life in many instances is that our soul, watch this, our soul has not been renewed. Now, when we are born again, our spirit, man or woman, is made new. That's why a Christian can never be totally possessed. Why? Because they are owned by God. Can I hear an Amen. But you can be influenced, right, by the enemy. You can be influenced by those thoughts if your soul does not allow the spirit to take charge. And the soul is constantly in conflict with the spirit. To the day we die, the soul will fight the spirit. You say, I don't know if I believe that. How, how was your past week this past week? Did anyone, yeah, and did anyone ever stumble? Did anyone have to repent this past week for attitude or, come on somebody, you know, the soul is always fighting against the spirit. And I said this, that, that when we were born again and we received Jesus Christ, 
One is born again is our spirit man and our spirit woman. That's what's cleansed. That's what's made new. That's what, where God takes residence in. But our soul needs to be renewed. That's your job, working with the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? And so we said this too about this walk of faith that our unsaved soul, that is the deciding factor on whether or not that Christ-likeness within you is going to be released out of your born-again spirit. So really, when you see some people and you say, you know what, they really, they claim to be a Christian, but they really act like the devil. Well, they're a believer, but their soul, come on, their soul has not been transformed by the Word of God. Are you awake this morning? All right? And so the sukkah, the soul has not been renewed. And we've said this each week also, a spiritual person is one who lives according to and is led by their born-again spirit. Now that, how many know, is the ideal. That is the standard, right? That's what we all want. I want that. I want to be led, but I fall short many times in that. But how many know we just get back up? We just get back up. No condemnation. We repent. We get back up. And so we want to be led by their born-again spirit instead of the body or the soul in our flesh. And uh, we said this, that, that that's what a spiritual person is. And we said the reason, watch this, the reason that we are to abide in the Word of God is that when we abide, we bear fruit. That's what the Word of God says. If we don't abide in God's Word and the importance of the Word in our life, we're not going to bear fruit. Now, how many of you know when you get to heaven, how many wants to have someone there to come up and say, thank you, you and your life and the fruit of your life affected my life? Every single one of you, I pray, there are hundreds of people, thousands of people that you know, you led someone to the Lord, or your life, your influence, how you acted influenced their life. Come on, amen? You want that? I don't want to be the person that shows up in heaven and it's like, well, I made it by the skin of my teeth. Well, you made it, amen? You're in, but <laughs> saved by fire, saved by grace. We want to be those that, 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 that we allow the Spirit of God to flow through our soulish realm and we allow Jesus to shine through our life. Can I get an Amen. And so what is the key? You want to bear fruit? Even Paul just shared this with the, the offering. We've been talking about it each week. Abide. Somebody shout abide. And we said abide is what? To remain. To remain. And so that's upon you. That's upon each and every one of us. So the question is, are you remaining? Are you abiding in the Lord? So how do I do that? How do I start? You get up. You seek the Lord. You, you have the Word of God. Maybe you have a lunch break. You have time to read the Word. Maybe it's an evening. You're a night owl. Maybe you're a morning person. You get it done. Does it matter? Does it matter? That's up to you. Every single one of us. Watch this. I can't stress this more enough. Every single one of us need a daily dose of the Word. I don't know how else to say it. I don't mean that judgmentally. I just mean that in a life-giving way. And so last week, we talked about the law of sowing and reaping. And uh, we talked about that it is a law for good and for evil. And when we, what we reap, you know, or what we sow, we're going to reap. And we said this, that the seed is not the problem. And we said the seed is the Word of God. Because why? Jesus said that. This is the meaning, Jesus speaking of the parable. The seed is the Word of God. So if you want to know how do I get good seed... These are my seeds up here that haven't been planted. They're a couple of years old. Uh, they have a shelf life. But how many know the Word of God does not have a shelf life? That seed is good for on and on. And, the, and so the seed is the Word of God. Um, <clears throat> you know, how many have ever seen a mustard seed? I saw a preacher one time have all his whole congregation come forward, and he had mustard seeds poured into his palm of his hand, and he had a lot of people in his church, and he had each and every one of them come up to look at the mustard seed. Well, there was a granny uh, that came up. She had real thick glasses. You couldn't see. And so she got closer and closer, and her breath blew all the seeds away because they were so small. And she goes, I can't see, Pastor. I can't. He said, you just blew all the seeds away. Such a tiny seed, Jesus talks about, grows into a big plant. You are sitting in a place that started with a seed back in 1999. We are reveling in a place, and not I'm not saying about, because about me, but at that point I was saying, Lord, what do you have for my life? Lord, what is the will for your life? 
I had my wife in seven different countries, and we were, you know, we were transitioning from, from one church and just kind of up in the air wondering, Lord, a very tumultuous time in our life, and maybe I'm supposed to go to Ukraine, maybe I'm supposed to go to Sri Lanka, maybe I'm supposed to be a missionary somewhere, or maybe I'm supposed to move to Texas, you know, like everybody else is trying to move to, or Florida, and I, I, so I was thinking, where am I supposed to go? Maybe I'm supposed to go back east, and, but I spent time, watch this, to get that seed planted, God, what do you want? I did not see all this. And this actually, as a pastor, was not what I felt called. I called to be an evangelist, to go overseas, to preach the gospel, do mission work. That's what I felt what my calling was. Lord had something different, didn't he? Amen? But I didn't know that seed when it's planted, saying, Lord, what do you want? And I sought the Lord and spent time and seeking in prayer and fasting. Lord, what is it? And then the seed of this church was started in the fall of 1999, and here we are today. Somebody say, praise the Lord. God is a miracle working God. Here's the thing. The seed works. The seed of God's word works. But it starts off small. And many people with that mustard seed that it's almost impossible to see, it's so small, get frustrated. They get frustrated. They don't see that it's growing. They don't see. They look and say, I planted it. But it still seems very small. Trust the word of God. Feed the word of God. Nurture that. How many with me say amen? And that will grow. It will grow. Some interesting facts about the seed is the word of God. Just going to go through this very quickly. That number one, it's incorruptible. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? The Bible says in Luke 21, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. You know what they're finding with this uh, James Webb telescope? Some of that stuff with space I like. There's the Hubble and they had to fix the lens because it was broken. And now they have James Webb, and, and they can see so far, 13 and a half, almost 14 billion light years. What they're finding out is that the galaxies that are furthest away are traveling faster than the ones here. Why is that? In the beginning, God said, let there be light. When God speaks, it never stops. They're still expanding. He didn't tell them to stop. They're still going. That's the God we serve. How many with me say Amen. So it's an incorruptible word. 1 Peter 1, 22, very powerful verse. Since you have purified your souls, watch this, there's that word soul, in obeying the truth, who has purified your soul? How many know that we have a part to play in that? And we need the power of God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brothers, hmm, loving one another, fervently, with a pure heart, having been born again by what? Not of a corruptible seed, a corruptible seed, but of what? Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Somebody say amen. Peter calls the Bible an incorruptible seed. The Greek word actually is indicative of not being liable, subject or susceptible to decay. That's what it actually means in the Greek. It's not liable to destruction, to marring or defilement or reduction to a worse state. You can trust the seed of the Word of God. The seed of the Word of God that's planted in and through your life that you act on in obedience, it will not be something that uh, goes to a worse state. It'll always produce for your life. The seed of the incorruptible Word of God is different than any other seed on the earth. <clears throat> Watch this now. This is why that Satan, his goal is to eradicate the Word of God in your life, out of your family, and he's done a great job in our country. He really taken the Bible out of school. I remember at times being in school that we would have a time of prayer in the public school. And I would remember praying. We'd have a minute. Then it was a moment of silent meditation. And there was times some of the public schools had the Ten Commandments. Can I get an amen? They took them out. Why? Because Satan knows the Word of God is so powerful that it'll affect people's lives. It'll change them for all of eternity, so he has to remove it. Why do you think Hitler burned Bibles? Why do you think Stalin burned Bibles? Why do you think even today they burn the Word of God? These radical groups today, they want nothing less than to deconstruct the entire nation. That's their goal. They want to rid themselves of God's Word. They want to remove the Ten Commandments from any public places because they don't want you and your children to see the Word of God because it has the power to change. Are you awake this morning? 
<clears throat> they want to rid themselves of God's truth, eradicating or make it, or make it illegal. <clears throat> they, want, they want human autonomy. They want to have their own self-rule. They don't want the absolute rule of Jesus Christ in their life. That's why there's such a battle for the Word. And I think about it, it's like, why would a world ruler burn Bibles? I mean, why don't you burn the whole Encyclopedia Britannica? Why don't you just burn encyclopedias? Or You know what I mean? Why don't you just burn the Harry Potter stuff or something? You know, why the Bible? Come on, somebody. Why the Bible? They burn the Bible because there's power in the Word. There's power. And if they can eradicate the Bible from before you, if it sits on your shelf and it's dusty, it's nice, and it looks pretty, it's still no power in your life. Hallelujah. I'm preaching better than you're responding. Amen. <clears throat> and so Satan knows for the true believer, he can't get you to throw the word of God out, but he can distract you. Mm. He can distract us. He can keep us busy, occupied with not reading and abiding in it because he understands the power in the word of God. Now, we know the seed that we buy, uh, that the natural seed is designed to be buried so that the life within it may be revealed and it will grow. And then the seed, what happens is it sheds off that shell and that new emerging life comes. Now watch this. In the case of the Bible, as a life-bearing seed, the incorruptible seed takes root in a corruptible life, someone that doesn't know the Lord. And what happens to it? That seed grows up within, demonstrating living characteristics that it never had before. What a powerful thing. While all that is earthbound, including the works of the flesh, are eventually cast off. That's the power of the word. Only the word remains undecaying and immortal. So the word of God is incorruptible. The second thing uh, about the word of God is that it is powerful. Some of shall powerful. Hebrews 4.12. I love this verse. One of my favorite verses. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any Two-edged sword, why? Piercing even to the dividing of thunder, uh-oh, of soul and spirit. The Word of God can get through all the ballast and the misunderstanding of, I don't understand, what's the Word for my life? The Word of God can cut through all of that. See, here's the thing. A double-edged, there were, Romans had a single-edged sword, and there was a name for that. And then a two-edged sword, a lot of references to the word rhema. So it cuts in and it cuts out. How many of you know that, that when, you know, the word of God, when we use it, it, it can cut through situations, but it also cuts in our own soul and deals with issues in our heart. Amen? And so it's the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I thought about that, okay, how do I develop that? The soulish and spiritual person. And so we've been talking about the great difference between the soul and the spirit. And here's the thing. It's saying in this verse that the soul and spirit needs to be divided. And so I have a little illustration here. And if I don't drop all this water everywhere in this little container, in this is just filtered water, nice filtered water from the church. Actually, we have great reverse osmosis here. I just thought I'd let you know. Some even the youth know that too. <laughs> and, and, and so in this water, how many know that really it's all pure, that it really doesn't need to be divided? So if you liken this to your spirit, so the Bible is talking about that the soul and the spirit needs to be divided. So by way of illustration, I just have some, some salt here. If I was to take uh, this salt and I mix it in this container here without spilling all this, how many know what's going to happen? This water is going to actually have now salt in it, and it's going to affect it. So some of you can still see that. You can see it at the bottom. But I'm going to try to mix it here a little bit without making a mess. Now, how many know it's a little bit harder to see that salt? But how many know the salt is in here? That, that if you let this settle, there's going to be some crystals that settle on the bottom. But you can look at this and you can think, well, this thing's pure water and drink it and go, Pfft. right? Because there's salt in it. How do you divide that? How do you separate that? The only way really to do that is to boil that, Right? What's going to happen to that water? That water is going to boil away. It's going to vaporize. And what are you going to be left with at the end? Salt. The point that, that I, I, I'm trying to make with that illustration, it's very simple. That's what the Word of God is able to do. The salt is the things of this life. 
you could relate it to, or whatever, if I put dirt in there, whatever. That is the things that we can't discern. It's hard to discern between the soul and the spirit. But the Word of God tells you, you know what? This activity is not right. Come on now. This be- Come on now. This behavior is going to affect you. The Word of God has the way to cut through and show you the pure Word. Cuts through all of that mess, that additive stuff in your life that it's hard to seem like, should I marry him or not? Should I marry her or not? How many know those are big questions? There needs to be big answers to that. Should I go off to college and get in $120,000 worth of debt, but I don't know what I want to do after I get out? Come on, somebody. These are big questions that we need answers for. Should I move here? Should I do this? Should I buy that? And we need the wisdom of God. Can you say amen? To sift through all that. And that's the voice of the Spirit of God and the soul. And so 1 Corinthians 2, another verse here I'll pull up. 1 Corinthians, but a soulish man, or you could say a woman, a person, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Uh Uh-oh. He is not able to know. He's not able to know them because they are discerned spiritually. Watch this. But the spiritual man or woman discerns all things. What I mean by it means a natural man. And a soulish man or a natural man, a man living in the soul. And we know that uh, the, the soulish man is impotent to the things of the spirit. They don't get it. And so a spiritual man, a spiritual woman, uh, they're able to discern the things of the Spirit. You know, when I think about a spiritual man, a spiritual woman, is if you have a single mom and she's taking her kids and getting them up, going to church and bringing her kids to Sunday school or training and in children's church and actively involved and serving and loving God, being a witness on the job, that's a spiritual woman. Did you hear that? Grandparents that are able to help with the grandkids and they take them to church and they love on them and and they get those kids to hear the word of God at such a young age. That's a spiritual grandparent. When a man, and I see, shows up at a church and he has his whole family there and they're there to worship and he got up. His wife didn't kick him to get, come on somebody. He got up and he's like, you know what? We're leading a family, we're going to church to hear the word. That's a spiritual man, okay? That leads his family, that leads his household. Are you awake this morning? And so it is by the Spirit that we understand and discern spiritual things. And it's in the Spirit, when we walk in the Spirit, that we desire to do those spiritual things. But when we operate soulishly, we cannot understand the spiritual things. And we actually not only don't understand, but we don't like it. In other words, hearing even this word, for some that are are operating soulishly, uh, we, we think it's actually foolish. That's what the Scripture says. It's foolishness. This don't make sense to me. This is stupid. This is idiotic. What are these people doing? What? The Bible? What? What's good? What? A book 2,000 years ago? You people are crazy. That's how the enemy, that's a foolish man. That is a soulish man. I think of the 1967 song, I'm a soul man. I'm not going to sing it, but come on. Dave and Sam, is that what the group, Sam and Dave? I'm a soul man. That's, that's typical of our, our, our people today. You know, many, many people today. They live out of the soul. But we know that the Word of God is very powerful. Can you say amen? And so the Word of God is also pure. Psalm 1940 says, Thy Word is pure, therefore thy servant loves it. And that Hebrew word means to actually smelt, to refine, to test as a goldsmith refines precious metals, unmixed. It, in other words, one translation says this, it purges away dross, it purifies your life. Uh, very interesting uh, thing uh, uh, that uh, I asked permission to share this, and, and, and Diane Clausen was telling me about a, a test, a, a, a light test that helps with their peripheral and had tremendous success with that, and it was a, 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 really a blessing to me when I heard her tell the story about that at, at one point she could only see closely, but going through this light test, it expanded the peripheral vision, and she showed me the chart from before and after, and I said, it's amazing. I thought, that's a word of the Lord. The word of God is a light, <laughs> and the word of God helps us see different. It helps us see farther. It helps us understand better. That's the power of the Word of God. Somebody say amen. It's a good word. It's a good word. And so Proverbs 35 says, every word of God is pure. 
He is a shield to them that put their trust in them. So here we have a special kind of seed. It is incorruptible. It's powerful. It's pure. It lives and abides forever. And the results of planting such seed can be quite special. Now let me just say something before I conclude here. Some interesting comparisons of the word. Uh, I'll go through this really quickly. But every good seed has within it the potential to develop into plant. Every good seed. Now, there are a total of 44 verses in the New Testament, as I read, where the Greek word sperma was translated seed. Very interesting. Same as our English word sperm. This tells me that God's life resides in his word. Now, ponder that. Ready to develop, giving the right conditions. So every word of God carries with it the power to accomplish exactly what it says it's supposed to do. Where is the problem? The problem is the soil. We're going to get into that next week. So if you take the germ away, you destroy the seed. You take away faith from the word of God, it has made no effect. Very powerful verse, Romans 10, 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and by hearing of the word of God. Let me say that again, just so you get it. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing and by hearing. And by hearing, faith comes by hearing. Come on, son. And faith comes by hearing, week in, week out. Faith comes by hearing daily. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing, all of a sudden, you get something. That's how the Word of God works. I'll give you an example of that, uh, about a rhema word uh, that uh, happened in my life. But before that, I remember a story. I've shared this before. That a rhema is a live word that after you hear, and you hear, and you hear, and God speaks a word to you, it becomes alive in your spirit. It's like you just know. You have assurance. You have an in persuasion, if I could say it that way. Uh, you, you, there's a living word within you. I think of the story of Dr. Paul Young and Cho in South Korea. And there was an article uh, in the Korean newspaper about 12 pastors that uh, <clears throat> Dr. Cho knew, a businessman that kind of ridiculed the church and his church, and, but a very powerful man. And so these pastors read the word of God where it talked about Jesus walked on water. And they felt they could walk on water. So they went into a very dangerous river in South Korea that was fast moving. And they got out of this boat, basically jumped out to w- walk on water and prove that they can walk on water. And they all drowned. See, what did they do? They stepped out on a logos. They stepped out on just reading the Word of God. But when Jesus tells you, come, you can do anything. (laughs) You can walk on water. You can do the miraculous, because he said. And that's what happens to a lot of people. We run out before we have that rhema word. What is God saying? Should I buy that house? Well, we're just going to go do this. We're going to do that. We're going to, you know, we plan all our plans. You know, that's a lot how the system of this world operates. But God wants us to operate through wisdom. And when he says something, does something, it's a success. All right? It's a success. And so, so that was, they didn't have a rhema word uh, from God. And, and, and it was a tragic uh, situation. Hebrews 4.2, let me just go back to this about mixing faith. Mixing faith in them that heard it. So how do you mix faith with the Word of God? How do you mix faith with the Word of God? Well, here's how you mix faith. The beginning. Your tongue. Your tongue is the mixer. I'm going to say that again. uh Uh-oh. Some of you, your tongue is mixing the wrong things. What we talk, how we talk to each other, how we talk in situations, respond. Can I get an amen? And I haven't been perfect in that. Sometimes you feel, oh me, whatever, what's going on in my life? Nothing's happening. Oh, you know, the tongue is a mixer, and the tongue will affect your life. I'm almost finished here. The tongue is a mixer. And so <clears throat> when you actually have a rhema word, you've heard something that affected you, it actually physically impacts your life, and it changes you forever for the good. Let me give a, a quick illustration, and we'll conclude here. In, uh, I was in Bible school in 1988. And I had just uh, been through my first year and in my second year, soon to graduate. And so they would have a general session and they would have guest speakers every week. Every week they would have a different guest speaker. We had national speakers. We had people who never even heard of before. But they were very prominent, most of them people. people. And I took notes. I leaned in. Some of them I liked. Some of them I didn't like. 
because I felt like a sheep being sheared. Come on, somebody. And, uh, uh, it, but it was all good for me. And I was praying about how does this ministry thing, thing happen? Lord, I have a heart to serve you. How is this going to happen? And so one of these guest speakers, I don't even know who he was. I can't remember today, but I do remember this word. Because when he shared this word, it jumped inside my spirit. Now, I'm going to share it with you, and some of you will go, okay, pretty, pretty nice, this word. But it was alive for me. Watch this. It was 1 Thessalonians 5.24. And it basically talks about he, faithful is he who calls you, he will do it. No big deal. It's no big deal. Faithful as he who has called you, he will do it. But at that moment, that became a rhema word to me. Why? I don't have to push. I don't have to try to make ministry happen. Can I get an amen? I don't have to try to push my way in to try to get a platform. He's going to do it. Amen. And then I went back and I read it from the Amplified. And what? looking back, I shared this with my wife, 35 years later of ministry. <clears throat> Maybe you can help me pull up that slide. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Watch this. This is a powerful verse. And I look back at my life and went, that's what he did. Faithful and absolutely trustworthy is he who is calling you to himself. He wasn't calling me to ministry. He, come on, somebody. He was calling me. He said, son, I'm calling you to me. It, it, all these other things are the outgrowth. First, to himself, for your salvation. And it says this, he will do it. Stand with me if you would, please. I'm almost done. It says, he will do it. The worship team, you come forward. He will do it. He will fulfill his call by making you, watch this, holy. Now, he, I am thank God that he's in, in, in working in conjunction with the spirit of God within me to help make me holy, amen? And I know my spirit man is new, but my soul still has some issues. <laughs> and, and then it says, he'll guard you. What a powerful truth. He'll watch over you, protecting you as his own. Wow, that was a rhema word. That was a rhema word over three decades ago in my life, and it's come true and come, past, come to pass in my life. You know, when I think about that, <clears throat> I don't understand why it took 21 years to, to build this new church building. I don't understand why in that time, those 21 years, in the worst of economic times, riots, inflation, shortage supplies. There was a time that <clears throat> we had all the windows because the window frames, they couldn't get the aluminum frames. So we had the, the, the window installer had to put like two inch rigid insulation just to, so we could get heat in the building. Well, where are they? They're on a dock somewhere in California, you know, on a ship. I'm like, keep praying, praying. The intercessors pray for the window frames to come. They came. <laughs> the windows are in. Amen. What am I trying to say? <clears throat> God said at that time, just before we started to build, Mike, now's the time. A rhema word came in my life. And I've shared this before. I really wish it was something more demonstrative. But all it was is a seed that said, you can do this through my power. I really wish like Jesus showed up, you know, and he was a bright light. And I was on my knees. Lord, tell me what to do. Build my son. None of that happened. None of that happened. All God said, you can do it now. See, when God says the resources will come in, people will help, people gave, people served, people came in, they cleaned up, people jumped in, and it happened. You know, interest rates right now are over 7%. But back then, our loan's only 2.8%. Hallelujah. God knew. God knew. 12 months ago, 12 months ago, if we would have waited, we wouldn't be able to do it. God said, now's the time. God knows the right time. For what you need in your life. The husband, the wife, the business. What's going on in your family. He knows the right time. You stay faithful. Stay consistent. Every head bowed this morning if you would please. Hallelujah. The word of God is powerful. It's incorruptible. The word of God is pure. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Lord, I pray right now you had deposited your people and encouraged them. And some of you are saying, like, I don't, I have something I'm praying about, but I just, I really feel I, I don't have anything attached to it. Lord, I pray you give them a specific scripture, a word for their life. Whether it's an answer for a spouse situation, <clears throat> a family planning situation, a work situation, 
Lord, whatever it may be, the next step in their life, give them a word that they can read and speak, line their hearts up. Lord, that they would see that seed that is sown grow to fruition in their life. You're here this morning as a pastor. I'm not right with the Lord. Perhaps maybe there's somebody in here, even a young person. You're not right with the Lord. You need to get right with God with every head bow. He said, Pastor, I need God in my life. The Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. You can receive Christ into your life, make him Lord of your life, and begin this process of a new spirit man or woman this moment on. I want to pray with you. You're here this morning. Let's pray in unison if we would. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Save me. Thank you for saving me. This day, I give you my life. Now take it. In Jesus' name, amen.